Hi guys, welcome back to our second live session here on the Ionicon. Uh, this is our first session that is focused on a topic that we've dealt with already in the set of in my last set of slides that I had up on the Instagram page. Um, today's discussion is on the prisoner's dilemma and more specifically on the prisoner's dilemma associated with climate change. I'm going to keep this very short. I don't expect too many of you to join me on the live stream here today, but uh, you can refer to this video as it will be up on our YouTube page, or on our YouTube channel. So please subscribe um, and refer to this when required. So the prisoner's dilemma is a very interesting branch in game theory. And game theory is a fundamental component of economics, uh, of behavioral economics, when you look at decision making uh, and examples of cooperative behavior um, by economic agents. So the term prisoner's dilemma was coined by Merrill Flood and Melvin Drescher uh, in the year 1950. Um, and where does this phrase prisoner's dilemma come from? Because it was framed as a game with prison sentence rewards. I'm just going to give you a brief outline as to why it's called the prisoner's dilemma. Because the example that is used by Albert Tucker is one where you have two members of a criminal gang that are arrested and imprisoned. And each prisoner is in solitary uh, confinement with no means of communicating with the other. And the prosecutors lack sufficient evidence. So they go up to each prisoner and ask them whether uh, they would uh, betray the other person or whether they will remain silent. At the point at which one of the prisoners chooses to betray uh, and testify that the other has committed a crime and the other uh, convict remains silent. The one who has betrayed the other gets away scot-free and the other has to serve a long sentence. So at that point, even though the most um, mutually beneficial outcome would be for both to remain silent, um, because of the threat that they could be in for a long span of time, provided that the other convict does testify against them, they both choose to testify against the other individual and they both end up serving the original, the original sentence. So this is a perfect example when it comes to analyzing cooperative behavior to see, when, to see a situation in which you don't get the best mutual outcome for both parties or for all parties because of certain threats uh, and because of certain, um, certain hazards involved. So how is this all relevant with, uh, with the issue of climate change? So I, I want to present to you an outline on why climate change is relevant in discussions on prison, why the prisoner's dilemma is relevant in discussions on climate change. So if you have two sets of countries, your uh, developing country and your a developed country, and these two sets of countries have their own independent agendas, be it economic growth, economic development, and they have their own sets of priorities and climate change or addressing climate change may not be a priority for them. If you look at developing countries specifically, most of the greenhouse gases we've emitted in, in history, most of the emissions that have led to us having problems dealing with climate change have been caused by the developed world during the time in which all those countries industrialized. So we are seeing the long-term ramifications of the industrialization that has taken place in the developed world. If you look at the developing world now, um, as they start industrializing, as they start developing their own industries, they don't want to take it upon themselves to cut down on growth or economic growth uh, in order to combat climate change because they feel that it is an unfair burden on them at the point at which the developed world has emitted without con constraints and reached a, a, a very stable uh, 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 stage of development. And I'm now just going to share with you the screen, um, including the slides that I presented to you earlier. Um, and I hope this helps you in, uh, in coming to terms with what I've been speaking about. So I'm just going to open a slide. Perfect. So if you can see this clearly, I'm referring to solving the prisoner's dilemma associated with climate change. I'm going to open this slide for us now.
Brilliant. Okay, so I want us to focus on this payoff matrix. Let's assume country A is a developing country and country B is a developed country. And by cooperating, I refer to uh, them make, making best efforts to combat climate change at its core. That could mean reducing emissions, that could mean cutting down on unsustainable projects uh, that lead to development, or that could merely mean perhaps signing an agreement of sorts. Uh, to uh, have controls on or caps on carbon emissions. So you have your country A and country B, and country B, mind you, in this case, is a developed country, and country A is a developing country. At the point at which they both cooperate mutually, they have the best mutual set of payoffs, which is four and four. So the first number in these payoff matrices is linked to the to country A, and the second number is linked to country B. So you have the you have country A being the row player in this case, and country B being the column player. So if they both choose to cooperate, they get the best mutual payoff of four. Provided the developing country does not cooperate, and the and country B being the developed country cooperates in this case, you see that the country that refuses to cooperate, being the developing country, has a much higher payoff of five, whilst the country that chooses to cooperate loses out significantly and has a payoff of one. So at the point at which country B realizes that in, at, the, at, at the stage in which it opts to cooperate, but country A refuses to cooperate, country B loses out significantly, so it, so it believes that it is its safest option if country A chooses to cooperate, uh, if, if country A chooses um, to cooperate, is for country B to cooperate as well. Uh, but at the point at which they realize, at the point at which you have this developing country in country A, realizing that, that at the equilibrium of four and four, where they both cooperate, they could have a, a higher payoff or a much better payoff by opting not to cooperate. There's an incentive for them to deviate away from cooperating and opt to not cooperate. And it's, it's, it's the same effect for country B. So at the point at which the incentive to deviate from cooperating and choosing to non, not cooperate results in a higher payoff, both countries are stuck in an equilibrium of two and two where they both choose not to cooperate because they don't want to lose out significantly by cooperating in the event that the other country opts to deviate. And at that point, you're stuck in this fourth equilibrium on this slide here, where, they both, where both countries choose not to cooperate. And that is, what has linked, that is what has led to the stagnation in terms of trying to combat climate change, or, or the stagnation in, in us trying to make sustainable ground or, or, or decent enough grounds to combat climate change. So how does this change, right? How do we make it mutually beneficial for both countries, both sets of countries, to cooperate. The only way we could do this is by changing the payoff matrices here. And how do we change these payoff matrices? You do it numerically. And this is the next set of slides that I have for you here, where we change the payoffs involved in cooperating and not cooperating. So in this case, hold on a minute, let me just push this up a tad. If you see country A still the developing country and country B being the developed country, as was the case earlier, we now punish, it's called punishing the player by reducing the incentive for them to deviate away from the mutually beneficial equilibrium. So in this case, at the point at which country B cooperates and we, and we assume country B cooperates, country A being the developing country is incentivized to cooperate because the payoff they receive of four is greater than the payoff they will receive by not cooperating, which is five minus two, which is equal to three. So at the point at which we completely eliminate the incentive of deviating away from the mutually beneficial equilibrium, both sets of countries opt to cooperate because the effects are vice versa on the other side. And how do we go about doing this? The only way we can hold developing countries accountable and, hold, and make sure that they do end up cooperating is by reducing the incentive for them to deviate by making it lower than the payoffs they would receive by cooperating. And that could be done by having a legally binding agreement on climate change. 
But as was discussed in the slides, we have not had an optimal solution to the prisoner's dilemma. And it, A, because it's an inexact science on how you can try to quantify uh, the effects of emissions and the effects you have on climate change, that individual countries may have on climate change. And B, because it's difficult to hold all countries accountable at the point at which they have their own economic agendas. So I hope these two slides were very clear in, sh in, in telling you why, it's, why, we've, why we are still stuck at this fourth equilibrium of 2-2, two -two, where both countries refuse to cooperate, and why, it's, why we need a legally binding agreement to enable all countries to shift to that first equilibrium we see on these slides here of 4-4, four, four, where they both end up cooperating, right? And that is basically the crux of what I wanted to tell you today. But I want to wrap this up by also giving you uh, an outline of why we haven't reached such an international agreement on climate change. We see international agreements like the Montreal Protocol on uh, CFC emissions, for example, but what but that that protocol or that agreement was catered to a specific set of countries and it was not a global um, agreement. And it was successful because most of these developed countries uh, had similar GDP levels. So at the point at which the, the, the rate of economic growth was fairly, um, was fairly consistent across these countries, it was, they were able to adapt and to, to adapt to mechanisms that would reduce CFC emissions, thereby agreeing to bide with the uh, uh, Montreal Protocol. But if, if you want a legally binding agreement on climate change that has both developing countries and developed countries party to it, you need to realize that there's a, there's a huge variance in terms of the rate of economic growth or the GDP levels of these countries. And at that point, because they may prioritize their economic growth and industrialization above the environment. And at the point at which they, there is no guarantee that the other party, be it the developed world or the developing world in this case, would agree to cooperate. And as was shown in the slides earlier, and as was explained using the payoff matrix earlier, you have an incentive to deviate and opt to not cooperate. Um, I'm going to keep this very short, um, and I want you all to refer to this when you all are dealing with uh, the prisoner's dilemma associated with climate change. Um, and I will be having uh, another live session uh, early this week, uh, early next week rather, in a couple of days on economics of migration, where we talk about, uh, the, uh, where, where we refer to the first set of slides that I presented on the impact of immigrants on native workers and on the labor, on, on your local labor market. I hope this clarifies any and all doubts you may have on the prisoner's dilemma. Do subscribe to the channel and do stay tuned for more content going forward. Thank you.